of our message title today is called The Outcasts because I really believe I hear the heartbeat of the Lord today speaking over every single one of us that you may view yourself as different, you may view yourself as an outcast, you may view yourself as even weird. You are here for a reason and you are, God has placed you on this earth, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. But I want to point you to the screen because I want to show you the top five freak show attractions of P.T. Barnum. Some of you have seen the movie, but you may not be aware. The first slide that you see to my left, and we're just going to breeze through these really quick, is the backdrop for what I'm going to bring you from the word. But the first person you can see on this flyer was Joyce Heth. And Barnum paraded her in before all people and told everyone she was 161 years old. 161 years old. She was a slave and he bought her for $1,000. And you're like, wow, yeah, this is back uh, early 1900s and so people were still doing those kind of things. And she had a disease and uh, her eyes were kind of swollen and sunken back into her head. And so he would pray her out there as a 161-year-old woman. And people would flock in to see this woman who was so old. In reality, she wasn't. She just had a medical condition. The second person I want you to see is Myrtle Corbin. She actually had four legs. Now, she had a medical condition where, as I was reading up on her, she had a, I, I hope I get this word right, dipagus twin, is that how you say that? Growing from her body that never fully formed in the womb. So she had, she was one person from the belly up, but the belly button down, she had two bodies. So she actually had four legs from the waist down. And so the, he, again, he was, she was one of the ones he picked out and singled out. And some of you might say, wow, that's kind of brutal for you to do that. But he paid her at the time $450 a week, which in today's money is equal to $11,000 a week. So he, she was another star of the show. The next one you want to see is Chang Yu Sing. And he was called the Chinese giant. And literally, he was over eight feet tall. Now, Barnum had a way of making things a little bit grander, so he told everyone that he was nine feet tall. But he was really eight feet tall, which is still super large. And he would clothe him in, in uh, Asian garb because he thought it made him even look bigger. So that's what was going on with him. The fourth person you've probably seen in the movie, and that's Charles Stratton. He was called General Tom Thumb. He was only 25 inches high, and he weighed 15 pounds. And Barnum taught him to sing, dance, and impersonate historic figures like Napoleon Dynamite. How many of you have seen the movie and seen him run on, ride that pony all across the show? Well, he is a real figure. Lastly, the star of the show, Josephine Clofulia, she was the bearded lady, and she suffered from a condition known as hypertrichosis. From the time she was eight years old, she already had a two-inch beard. And so he would parade her out, and again, you see, if you've seen the movie, you've seen this person who was just like withering in the background, and uh, P.T. Barnum says, it's time for you to come out of the shadows, and it's time to come out with all of your grandeur, and just be you. And I believe the same God is calling out to every single one of us here. So often in our lives, we want to remain hidden. So often in our lives, we want to hide the things that we think are ugly. And only God himself says, I can bring beauty from ashes. Is that true? That's truth, right? So Barnum saw value in these outcasts. And I'm here to tell you today that God sees value in you. In the beginning of Matthew, there is the pedigree of Jesus. There is his genealogy. Now, when I talk about pedigree, I think about my dog, Nico. I have a mini schnauzer, and I love him to death. If you were on Facebook a few days ago, you saw me post a picture of him, and he is a purebred mini schnauzer 
But there's a problem. He doesn't have his papers. And as much as I love him and I think that he is the greatest dog in the world, and he can roll over, he'll lick your face, he'll clean up the scraps off the ground that the girls drop. I mean, he's just a fantastic dog. Yes, if you come to my door, he'll bark like crazy and squeal. But he's just a fantastic dog. If I were to try to take him to a dog show, if I were to try to take him to, some of you on Thanksgiving saw the new Westminster dog show that it's always on, they, he would be laughed out of the door. They wouldn't, even, they wouldn't even look at him because he doesn't have the right papers. And so as we begin by looking at the book of Matthew and how this whole thing begins and the birth of Jesus, it begins with this genealogy and Matthew is written to the Jews and he wants to portray why Jesus is king. And so if Jesus is king, they want to look at his family line. Now, before I jump into this, I want to give you a little bit of history. To the Jews, this meant an awful lot. In fact, so much so that they wanted to personally trace their own family line all the way to Abraham. And if you could do that, you were a good Jew. But if you could not do that, you were an outcast in their society. It meant everything. So as Matthew was being laid out, the genealogy was being laid out, they were trying to show Jesus's connection all the way. And so I want to take you there right now. If you turn to Matthew chapter 1, 1 through 17, and this is the part in the Christmas story that you usually bypass and skip over. But I believe there's some hidden truth for us here today. It says, this is the record of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah, descendant of David and of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose, name, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron, Hezron was the father of Ram, Ram was the father of Amininadab. That's why we skip these, right? And he was the father of Nashon, and Nashon was the father of Salmon. I can say Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz, his mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, his mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. Solomon was the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was the father of Jehoram. Jehoram Horam was the father of Uzziah. Uzziah was the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amon. Amon, the father of Josiah. Josiah, the father of Jehoiakim and his brothers, born at the time to the exile in Babylon. After the Babylon message, Jehoiakim and his father... And the father of Zerubbabel. <laughs> Zerubbabel, the father of Abiad, Abiad, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok was the father of Achim, Achim was the father of Eliad, Eliad was the father of Eleazar, Eleazar was the father of Methon, or Matan, who was the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary gave birth to Jesus, who is our Messiah. Everybody say, I'm glad he's done reading that. <laughs> I'm glad to be done reading that. Wow. That's a mouthful. But I realize that scripture says, doesn't it say this? That every scripture, every I, every cross T is useful for teaching us doctrine, correction, reproof. Why is all that? in there. Well, I want to show you something today. I believe there are four people mentioned in that genealogy that to the Jewish mindset of the day had no business being in there. No business. They were outcasts and yet they were made and put in the genealogy of Jesus. 
Let's look at these really quickly. I'm just going to reference them because I want to make a few points at the end. The first one we see mentioned there is Tamar. Tamar, Genesis 38. And her story is very extreme. She was the daughter-in-law of Judah, one of Jacob's sons, and very important, who was a very important person in Old Testament history, right? She married Judah's son, Ur, but he died before she had any children. So according to custom, she was supposed to marry her brother-in-law so that she wouldn't be childless. But Onan would not give her a child. And so God was upset and took his life. Wow. Again, according to the custom, she was supposed to be married to Judah's third son, but he drug his feet and did not give his son to Tamar. So she appeared to, doom, to be doomed to die without ever giving birth to a child whatsoever. And so this woman took matters into her own hand. She dressed up like a prostitute, and she waited until her father-in-law Judah came along. And she caught his eye, and he hired her, he laid with her, and she gave birth to a child through him. Everybody say, Bleh. <laughs> Well, when Judah found out that his widowed daughter-in-law was pregnant, he was going to have her burned at the stake until it was revealed that he was the father. And because of her deception, she had two children, Perez and Zerah, and through them, the line of Jesus would come. Somebody say, wow, that's in the Bible? Genesis 38. Some of you are like, I don't read the Bible, it's so boring. Man, you're reading the wrong places. <laughs> so here's this tragic story of this woman, Tamar. Next in the story, in this genealogy of Jesus, we see Rahab. Joshua 2 and 6. She was a Canaanite woman, so she wasn't even a Jew. The Canaanites were the enemies of God's people who fought the Israelites every step of the way as they tried to enter into the promised land and into all of God's promises. And her fascinating story, again, is found in Joshua 2. Not only was she a Gentile, she was a hated Canaanite. And to make matters worse, she was a prostitute. And she lived in the city of Jericho, inside the wall. And the Israelites had come against uh, the city of Jericho. And spies were sent into Jericho. And they actually stayed with her in her, I guess it would be her brothel or her home. And the king came to her and said, if you see these people, let me know. And she's like, I haven't seen nobody. And so she lied. She lied that they'd ever been with them, with her, I should say, and they let the spies of Israel go so the city could be conquered. And she, you know the story, she lowered them down from the wall and they could escape. And then she tied a scarlet cord in the, in the window and so they knew when they attacked the city to leave her alive. But this is a woman that was put in the genealogy in the genealogy of Jesus, not only was she a prostitute and a Canaanite, not even Jewish, but she was a liar and a good one at that. <laughs> and you might say, well, it was a good white lie. It's still a lie. And yet here we find her in the genealogy of Jesus when they're laying it all out for everyone else. Look at the king. Look at where he comes from. She's in the story. The next person we see is Ruth. Now, Ruth was a good woman, but she came from a very bad background and pedigree. And I'm sure that this church is filled with people like this who, ah, I don't want you to go into so much of my history. Let's talk about my future. Let's talk about my now. But let's leave a few of those skeletons in the closet. But she was a Moabite woman, and the Jews were forbidden to marry anybody from Moabite, from Moab, sorry. They were considered the worst of the Gentiles. But during a bad famine, a Jewish man named Elimelech 
went to Moab with his two sons, and his two sons didn't care so much about the law that God put out, and, they, and one of them married a Gentile woman whose name was Ruth. Now, we don't have time to tell her whole story, but the son ended up dying, and she ended up with no heirs and all of the rest, and eventually she found Boaz in the field. He became their kinsman redeemer. I would preach that to you because it's the most beautiful story in the scripture. It shows a picture of Christ, but to make a long story short, this outcast woman who should never even had a contact with a Jew somehow found herself in the genealogy of Jesus. Wow. Number four, Bathsheba, 2 Samuel 11 and 12. You know her story. David, the scriptures say, it was later on in, a little later on in years, and he was supposed to be out at battle. It says, as kings do in the spring, but David stayed home. Just goes to show you, you're, I'm happy you're all in church. If you would have stayed home, something bad could have happened. But David is out on his roof walking around and he happens to look across and he sees this beautiful woman in all of her glory, buck naked, taking a bath. And he was like, ooh la la. He needed some of that. So he inquired and he found out that this woman was already married to one of his generals. But that didn't stop him. So he summoned her to the palace. And you guys know the story. He got her pregnant. Then not only did he get her pregnant and had an adulterous affair, he found out she was pregnant and tried to cover it. So he sent her husband to the front lines with a death order that as the fighting was intense, the army was to pull back so that her husband would get killed. So he would not get taken out. So this whole thing would be covered. Well, the prophet of the Lord, again, nothing escapes God's eyes. And the prophet of the Lord shows up and pulls his card. And because of that, the baby that she was bearing actually died. But eventually, she gave birth to Solomon. And again, we see that out of this horrific story of deceit, treachery, sexual immorality, and even murder, this woman is mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. And I ask you why. Matthew had to know as he was penning this, obviously the Holy Spirit is breathing this through him for a reason. But to the onlooker, if you were going to lay out the genealogy, you would cut off all the crooked branches. Some of you know what I'm talking about. It's like all of the family comes together for Thanksgiving, but there's some family that you're like, they only come Thanksgiving. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, hmm. If I could cut off a branch or two, you know, and we try to make ourselves look better, but in this case, right smack dab in the middle of this story, we see these shocking women that shouldn't even be there. They have not just one strike or three strikes against them, they have four strikes against them. So I want you to write this in your notes if you're following along. Strike one, some of them are Gentiles. If you are laying out why they are, have a straight line to Abraham. You would never include Gentiles in that. They were considered unclean. And here are some Gentiles right there in the genealogy of Jesus. Strike two, sinners involved in deceit, prostitution, and even murder. Strike three, their lives are tragic. You know, if I want to talk about my history, I'll be like, hey, did you know that my dad's mom was one of the first evangelists to ever roll across Canada, woman evangelist and preaching the gospel and all that? I'm like, yeah, that's my history. I'm not up here saying, hey, did you know that I have an aunt who uh, was on Dr. Phil? 
Actually, she was a cousin. Don't Google it, please. You know, you kind of slide over those ones. These women were tragic. They lose four husbands between them. And the fourth strike, as you know, were they were women. And written in that day and who it was written to, this would not have impressed anyone. Women back then, it wasn't like today. I'm thankful for Jesus. I'm thankful that he said there's neither slave nor Greek, male nor female. We are all one in the body of Christ. He promotes. Women can preach and prophesy just like any, better than any man can. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. But back in those days, the women were kind of told to be seen and not be heard. And so, in fact, some of the scholars and theologians that I read this week said that they went as far as viewing women as property, as cattle, way back then. And so there's no way, if you were trying to impress someone, you would include these four women in the genealogy of Jesus. All four were truly outcasts. They were bearded ladies, so to speak, in the genealogy of Jesus. So why were they there? I'm here to make a point that I believe God is making to each one of us today. I believe that those four women were in there because number one, God wanted you to see the power of his grace. The power of his grace. To accomplish his purposes, God can and will use anyone he wants to. In fact, the scriptures even tell us that he will use the foolish to confound the wise. Yeah. Some of you wonder, why are you up here? Well, there it is. <laughs> it's not because I got it all together. Ask my wife. But God chooses who he wants to choose. And God is choosing you. You may be sitting here today feeling useless, stuck. You may feel like you have nothing to offer. You may say, Pastor, you don't know my history and my background. But I'm here to tell you, grace is unmerited favor, undeserved kindness. And God is pouring out his grace on you even now. And he wants you to know the power of his grace. Titus chapter 2 verse 11 through 14 says, For the grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. And we are instructed to turn from God this living and sinful pleasures. We should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God. While we look forward with hope to the wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will be revealed. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. His grace is an empowerment for you to live differently. It's not a, a blank card that says, oh, go and do what you want. It's power to live different from the world, different than the way you used to. Yes, your history may be something suspect, but I'm here to tell you your future is bright in the kingdom because of God's grace. Grace means that all of your mistakes now serve a purpose instead of serving shame. How good is that? That his grace empowers you to live in this world as a new creation. I saw on Facebook this week, so you know it's true. Anything that you read there. <laughs> no, it's just a good quote. It said, when God put a calling on your life, he already factored in your stupidity. Somebody say amen. God knew everything about you and he still chose you because he said, my grace is sufficient. In your weakness, I will be strong. These four ladies are in there to show you. They were outcasts to show to every single one of us sitting here today that God's grace is enough for you. You can rise up and be all that God purposed you to be. Number two, I believe the second reason that's in there is so you can see the power of God's forgiveness. 
the power of God's forgiveness. God is willing to forgive the worst of sins if we are simply willing to come to him. You know, sitting in this crowd of this size and they're told me, hey, pastor, there's no more seats and this and that and all of our children are out. That's good, that's good news. <coughs> I know that there are people here today who feel conviction. You're like, pastor, you don't know what I was doing last night or this last week. My life is filled with regrets. Well, look at these four ladies. You want to talk about regrets. You want to talk about skeletons in the closet. And God is very awesome. He says, you don't have to clean up to come to me. He simply says, just come and watch what I'm going to do in your life. That's the power of his forgiveness. <laughs> Ephesians 1, 7 says, in him. Everybody say, in him. Amen. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. So forgiveness doesn't change the past, but it does enlarge your future. See, some of you are still wondering, how come my life is in shambles and crumbles, and, and it's just crumbling and chaos all around? It's because you don't come and place your hands in the one who loves you. He knows the worst about you and he still loves you. He loves you more. In fact, he can't love you anymore. He loves you as much as love can love you on your worst day and your best day. And all he says is, come to me. Come to me with your life and lay him at my, and I will show you the power of forgiveness. I read a quote one time from A.W. Tozer that I hang on to, and it said, God will take nine steps towards you, but he can't take the tenth because he can't do the repenting for you. And I think that there's a lot of people who are like, ah, oh, pastor, I took a step toward the Lord. I took, I, I kind of went near him, and scripture's true. As I draw near to him, he will draw near to me. But repentance is changing the way you think. God is not an evil taskmaster. The father is not looking, saying, I know what you did. Poof, poof, I'm going to get even with you. All of his wrath was poured out on his son on the cross. And out of his great love for you, he sent his one and only son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. There is forgiveness waiting for you. No matter what you've done, no matter what your past is, God is not sitting back saying, oh, if you come to me, I'm going to beat you down. He's saying, come to me and let me love on you and let my love transform you. You need to know the power of forgiveness. See, some of us are just trapped in our past. We can't seem to break out because, oh, you don't know about me, Pastor. I was abused. Pastor, I was this. I was that. The power of forgiveness releases you. It doesn't make all of that okay. What it does is it says, you will no longer be held in prison of your past. And I'm going to bring you into a new future. In fact, that's why it says, behold, the old is gone, the new has come. You are now a new creation in Christ Jesus. If you're sitting here saying, Pastor, you don't know what happened to me, and that's why I live my life the way I did, you are living less than what Christ purchased for you on the cross. It's time to embrace the fullness, the power of his forgiveness. So if you have skeletons in your closet, if you feel you're not worthy, the four outcasts in the Christmas story show you that you can do it, that you can rise up in his power, in his grace, and in his forgiveness. Lastly, I believe those four outcasts are in there to show you the power of God's mercy. Yeah. The power of God's mercy. God loves to use the least likely tools for his tasks. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Everybody say that with me. Mercy triumphs over judgment. God wants to show you his mercy. God wants, you know, mercy is not getting what you deserve. And he's saying, I am not here to beat you down. I am not here to punish you. I want to show you mercy. And then I want to show you empowerment, which is grace, so you don't have to live like you used to live. You need to know my 
mercy. Lamentations 3, 22 through 23, one of my favorite verses says, the faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is his faithfulness and his mercies begin afresh every morning. Man, I'm thankful that his mercy for me is fresh every morning. Somebody say amen. amen. I just need fresh mercy. And you want to know why? Well, it's not your business. <laughs> but you need his mercy too. And if you want to act like you don't, let me talk to your spouse after church. <laughs> God's mercy is bigger than any mistake you've ever made. And that's the beauty of this. He's showing us through these four women who have no business being trumpeted to the world in the genealogy of Christ. He's telling everyone, my mercy is so much greater. Do you know what I plan to do with your life? Do you know what I plan to do with your family? Do you know what I plan to do with this imperfect church? Do you know what I plan to do in this imperfect city? My mercy is so much greater than any mistake, any issue that you may have. His mercy triumphs and it's new every morning. I want to close by giving you a quote that I believe is at the heart of what God is speaking to us this morning. The quote is simply this, God can strike a lot of straight blows with a crooked stick. God can strike a lot of straight blows with a crooked stick. And many of us look at our own lives like these people in The Greatest Showman Four-legged woman, I'm a freak. Little two-foot man, I'm a freak. A bearded lady, I'm a freak. And yet they were put on display and millions flocked and they made millions of dollars. And even if you watch the movie, they're like, we don't know if we bring the people such joy and maybe some of them are laughing at us, but we have become a family. And that's what God is doing in speaking over us here today. As we come into this Christmas season, your life may be filled with thoughts of regret and guilt. You may think of all the skeletons you have in the closet, but I want you to remember the outcasts included in the genealogy of Jesus. Great is his grace for you. Great is his forgiveness for you. Great is his mercy for you because our God is Good. Amen. Everybody stand with me and let me pray for you. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning? I always tell this church, bowing your heads and closing your eyes doesn't make you more spiritual. It makes you less distracted. So as you bow your heads and close your eyes, no one's moving around, no one's looking around. We just want to quiet ourselves because often God speaks in a still, small voice. Maybe you're here today and you were the one I was talking to. You're saying, Pastor, you don't know what I've been doing. I know that I'm not right with God. I know that I haven't been living for Him. I know I've been making horrible choices. I, I look ugly. The Lord says, no. You're beautiful to me. And I want you to know my forgiveness. I want you to know that your sin doesn't have to be held against you. That you can come and you can lay it at my feet and I will take it from you. And I'll remember it no more. In fact, I'll throw it away as far as the east is from the west. If you're here today, nobody's looking around. The Holy Spirit is tugging on your heart and you know that you're not. If you had to stand before him, you'd be ashamed. And he's saying, I'm not here to beat you down. I'm here to remove the weight from your shoulders. That you don't have to walk out with the same crud you walked in here with. You can walk it out in freedom. 
If you're here today, nobody looking around, this is just you doing business with God. And you want to make your peace with Him and you're saying, I need to know the power of His forgiveness. I'm going to count to three and I want you just to lift your hand. You know you're not right with Him. And we're going to say a prayer together. And you're going to feel the peace of the Lord come on you. If you need to know the power of His forgiveness, I'm going to count to three. I want you to lift your hand. One, two, three. I see that hand. I see that hand and that hand. Three, four, five, six, seven. Have courage in the house of the Lord today. Seven, eight, nine. Thank you, Jesus. You can put your hands down. I'm going to just lead the whole church in this prayer. I'm just going to say a simple prayer, and if we offer in faith, He will hear it. And he will forgive us. Everyone in here, if you would repeat after me, Father, I want to know the power of your forgiveness. I give you my life today, all of the good and all of the bad. I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I understand what Jesus did for me on the cross. He took my punishment so that I could be free. Today I accept that gift and I acknowledge that I am free and forgiven. Because according to your word, if I confess my sin, you are faithful to wipe it away and that's what I embrace today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I thank you for the nine of you who had courage, but I still want you to bow your heads, close your eyes, because there's a couple more things that the Holy Spirit wants me to highlight today. Because he's not just speaking to nine, he's speaking to us all. The next I'm supposed to ask, maybe you're here today and you're feeling like you're stuck. You're feeling like a wallflower. You're feeling like you're in, stuck in a grind. You're wondering what your purpose is. You're wondering, man, God, I feel like there's so much more for me. And the reality is you need to become impacted with the grace of Jesus. That he has not only saved you from your sin, but he saved you for a purpose. That his glory would be revealed in and through you to the world out there. You need to know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. His empowerment, his divine favor. If that's you today and you're saying, God, I, I want a fresh revelation of your grace. I want you to lift your hands. I'm going to pray for that this morning. Oh, yeah, so many of us wanting a fresh revelation of grace. I'm not even going to count. There's too many hands. Father, I pray right now that all whose hands are raised would have a fresh encounter with your grace, that your grace would overwhelm us. Holy Spirit, you are the ones, you are the one, you are the one who can do this work of empowerment, of empowering us to walk different in the world. You are not forgotten. You are not an outcast. You are chosen. And I hear the Holy Spirit saying, as you seek Him first, everything else will be taken care of. And there's somebody here, I, I just feel the prompting of Holy Spirit, someone here who's striving so hard to make something of yourself. And I hear Holy Spirit saying, are you finished yet? Now let me, let me show you what I can do. 
See, some of you are wearing yourself out and burning yourself out because you're trying so hard instead of stepping into grace, stepping into the unmerited favor, the empowerment. There's a difference between asking God to bless what you're doing and stepping into what he is already blessing. And I just feel that the peace of the Lord is coming. So, Father, those who need a revelation of your grace, receive it right now, that you are a new creation, empowered in Jesus' name. We thank you for your mercy. Father, we thank you for such a poignant message this morning, showing us in the details of a genealogy your grace, your forgiveness, and your mercy, how you champion the outcasts. And God, it's out of your great love. You said in your word that we can love because you first loved us. And we receive this great love and in turn, let us love well. So Father, I speak that over this entire church that we are gonna go out in the community and love well because we are loved by you. We are not outcasts. We are no longer orphans, but we are sons and daughters of the King. Cement that in our hearts, I pray, Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you and thank you for being at Bethel today. We are